So this is very personal for me because our speaker is a good friend of mine. Uh, in the year 2012, Ridley Theological College in Melbourne, Australia asked me if I would leave Oxford and go there and start the Marketplace Institute, which is very similar to the Mocker Center. Uh, and I said, yes, I would love to do that, but for family reasons, I actually wasn't able to move there full time. So I commuted back and forth for three years between Oxford and Melbourne. And uh, they said, we can make that work because we'll just hire an associate dean who will do most of the work and you'll get most of the credit. And I thought that was a good way to do it. So Kara and I had kind of an arranged marriage. We hadn't met each other until the first time we both arrived on campus and we were put together by people who knew us both, but we hadn't met each other. And like a good arranged marriage, over time, well, we learned how to really love and respect and nurture each other, and we've remained friends all this time. So when I was asked by the missions committee if I knew any speakers for this conference, I was very concerned that we not fall into the trap that business as mission is using business as a Trojan horse just to get access to people. The business matters. The work matters. Our work is supposed to be our worship. So if we're going to do business as mission, we have to treat it like medical missions or any other missions where the work itself really matters. And so no one does that better, in my opinion, anywhere than Kara Martin. She has two books, Workship, which is how to use your work to worship God, and now Workship 2, which is how to flourish at work. I highly encourage you to purchase both of these books. She's given us a special price. They're available outside the door and also outside uh, the uh, lecture area, the, the alumni area, where she'll be speaking later today. Which brings me to one last uh, announcement. Uh, the Student uh, Association has asked that some faculty stay behind after the service and pray with students. We're going to do that for about 10 minutes. Then after that, please, everyone, make your way to the alumni hall and listen to a lecture that will be an extension, if you will, of what you hear at chapel, you will not be disappointed because Kara truly is uh, one of the foremost authorities on this whole question of how do we make our work, our worship. So would you please give a very warm Gordon Conwell welcome to Kara Martin. Sometimes when you're introduced, you really look forward to meeting the person that there, that's being introduced until you realise it's actually you. Um, <laughs> I want to thank uh, the Chrissy Wilson Centre for inviting me here. I want to thank Ken for putting my name forward. Uh, and I also want to thank Carol Kaminsky for teaching you all how to understand Australian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I also wanted to mention that uh, that first uh, song that we sang, that first worship song, uh, gives me a bit of a tremor every time we sing it. You might notice that in the chorus, uh, we sing, set your church on fire. And when I was working with Ken down in Melbourne, that literally happened to the church <laughs> that I was worshipping at. Uh, so every time I sing it, um, you know, part of me says, okay, I'm prepared for you to do that, Lord, but <laughs> I'm hoping that it's metaphorical. Um, <laughs> okay, so my job this morning is to take you through a theology of work in 25 minutes. And I've been told if I go over time, there will be a riot. And so I will, uh, I will really attempt to do that. Uh, so what I want to do is give you six vignettes uh, from the Bible, six verses to sort of anchor each thought, and six what I hope will be mind-blowing ideas. Now, they may not be mind-blowing ideas for you. I hear you're an incredibly intelligent, well-biblically-informed group of people. But these were the sort of mind-blowing ideas that I had to deal with uh, in 30 years of wrestling with this topic. I was a very green TV journalist um, who walked into a newsroom and I suddenly realised that I was hopelessly ill-equipped for walking into that place as a Christian and knowing how I should respond to what was happening around me. Um, and all my life since has been wrestling with God to know how can we actually 
do this? What do you say in your word? What wisdom can I draw upon? How can I be the best Christian in every place in which you place me? How can I live out my faith 24-7? So the six vignettes I've chosen um, draw on a book, Drama of Scripture, some of you may be familiar with. It's a wonderful book by Craig Bartholomew and Michael Goheen. Uh, and I'll be drawing on their model. I love it because uh, it really talks about the Bible as a, as a story, a big story. I don't know about you, but when I give my testimony, I often use the words, I invited Jesus into my heart. But the reality is at the point of conversion, what is actually happening is that God is inviting us to join him in his story. And that's what I'm going to paint the picture of this morning is his story and uh, how he talks about work. So let's start, let's start with the first vignette, which is creation. So of course in Genesis we have this beautiful picture of God at work, God at work creating the world, this beautiful place, this beautiful playground that he's given us to play in. And uh, he creates these three kingdoms of light and darkness and of air and sea and of the land. And then he fills these kingdoms with the sun and the moon and with the birds and with the fish and then with the animals. And then he creates human beings. And the very first command that he gives human beings is to work, to steward his creation to actually steward the relationship between us and creation. That's our very first command. And we see that painted in a little more detail in Genesis 2.15, which is the first verse that I want you to remember. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And of course, those of you who are Hebrew scholars will know that the Hebrew roots of that till the earth, the work the earth is avad, and keep the garden is shema. And those are the same words that are used later in the Pentateuch to talk about serving or worshipping God and also keeping the commandments. So right there from the very beginning of the story, we have this beautiful link between work and worship. Those things were always meant to be seen as together. They weren't meant to be seen as separate things. And yet, we often separate them. So the semi-mind-blowing idea, which I've already given away, is that work and worship go together. They're always meant to be together. We can use our work to honour God. We can use our work to actually do, do this stewarding role that he's given us. And this was the way that it was always meant to be. I love also that slightly later, God does this beautiful thing of inviting us to work with him. So he takes the man and he says, come, name the animals with me. This beautiful knowledge work, we would call it these days, creative work where the human being is invited to actually name the essence of each creature. We are meant to use our work together with God. We are meant to work with God and to see our work as part of working in partnership with him. We work together in harmony. So that's vignette one, creation. Vignette two, you probably can already guess really quickly. This, this beautiful image of humanity and God working together, it ends pretty quickly, doesn't it? We have the entry of, of sin and evil and we have the story of the fall. Harmony is ruptured. Now, I think that for most people, including the world outside these walls, the fall is really the way they see work. So work is seen by most people as a four-letter word. I know it's a four-letter word, but, <laughs> but they see it as some sort of horrible thing. I want you to think of all the synonyms for work. Toil, labour, drudgery, grind. Are you getting excited? <laughs> In Australia, we call work hard yakka. Can I hear you say that back to me? I'd just love to hear you say that. Hard yakka. One, two, three. Hard yakka. 
Next time a professor gives you an essay which is really difficult, you tell them that that was hard yakka, okay? <laughs> uh, you may think um, that I'm going to leap here for the verse to the cursing of work in Genesis 3. And of course, that's where we find out why work is so hard these days. Because we have this problem that we have to work so much harder to do what had previously been so easy. We have to work with the sweat of our brow. And we have these thorns and thistles that come up and interfere with our work. They're, it's frustrating and it's difficult. But actually, I want you to think about something that occurs a bit later. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel or Tower of Babel. There, humanity decides to do some work. Now, it could be good work. It could be glorious work. You know, it's this building work. The people are working together to build a tower. And not just a tower, they're actually building a city. And they work together really well, and they work to build something that reaches up to the heavens. The verse is Genesis 11.4. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And here I think there's a warning for us in our work. Work inside the church, work outside the church. Why are we doing that work? Are we doing that work to make a name for ourselves? Are we doing that work to make a name for God? I think sometimes we say that it's for God and sometimes actually there's a whole load of ego that's caught up in that work. We too can succumb to that subtle temptation to make our work whatever it is, even when it's really good work, to make it into an idol. So we have creation, we have the fall, and then we have the third vignette. The third vignette is the story of Israel. So God calls the people into obedience, and he starts with a farmer, Abram, and his barren wife, Sarah, and he sets before them an impossible vision. So Genesis 12 to, you are very familiar with these verses, I'm sure. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It's an incredible vision, isn't it? Especially for an old, old man and his old, old wife. And she's barren. She can't have children. It seems an impossible vision. How can this possibly come to be? Exodus 19, 4 to 6, has a similar amazing vision. Here we have the story traveling a lot later where Moses has led the people out of slavery in Egypt. And then they gather at the foot of Mount Sinai and God tells Moses to address the people. And he says to Moses, this is what I want you to tell the people. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is a rag tag bunch of ex-slaves. How did they hear those words? You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So this is the mind-blowing idea number three to think about work, that God often paints for us this big vision about what he is going to do, a vision that, that tests us, that just draws us in. It seems impossible. It's so much more than we could do in our own strength, in our own ability. And he uses that to motivate us, but he also uses that to inspire us when things get difficult, when things get tough, when we face trials, when we face tribulations. We remember that vision that he set before us. 
I can see some of you nodding because I can see that some of you have had that experience of God where he's placed this vision before you, he's placed this idea. You had no idea how that was going to come to pass and then he's shown you how you can work towards that and how it can happen. So we've had creation, we've had the fall, we've had Israel and then we have the fourth vignette which is Jesus. So Jesus emerges from the people of Israel as the promised Messiah, the true king, not just of Israel, but of the whole world. He's going to restore shalom. He's going to restore right relationships. But of course, he does it in an entirely unexpected way. He is not the political ruler that they expected that the Messiah might be. He's not the priest that they expected. Instead of being the priest, he actually offers himself as the sacrifice. He's not quite the prophet they expected either. He's this humble, servant-hearted teacher. Jesus sets out his mission in Luke 4, 18 to 19. I wonder if you remember the story. He goes up to Nazareth, as is his custom, and he goes to the synagogue. And they actually invite him forward to do the reading. And he takes the scroll, and the scroll is from the book of Isaiah, and he unrolls it to Isaiah 61, and then he reads these words. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Now, we sometimes shrink that mission statement to something that's purely a spiritual reality, that Jesus will open the eyes of people who are spiritually blind and he will set free people who are in spiritual bondage. But Isaiah 61 is actually an image of a whole nation that's transformed. Isaiah 61 talks specifically about business practices that have been corrupted, but that's not going to happen anymore. There's not going to be scales that don't weigh things properly. It talks about buildings that are going to be built so they actually stand <laughs> and they last. It talks about uh, harvesting. It talks about garment making. It talks about all sorts of different work. So when Jesus is talking about proclaiming the year of the Lord's favour, he's actually talking about all levels of society, all the different sort of work that we do whether it's the, the paid work that we might do or whether it's the work in the community or the work at home, every area of society is going to be transformed, is able to be transformed because of what Jesus has done. He wants reconciliation in every area. So here's your mind-blowing idea number four. Jesus talked a lot about repentance. And uh, I don't know about you, but when I heard about repentance, I have sort of this Sunday school definition that goes through my head where repent means that you turn away from sin and you go in the opposite direction. But the word repent in Greek actually means a new way of looking, a new way of conceiving and understanding. That's what repent means. So what we actually have here is that Jesus enables us to have a new way of looking at God a new way of looking at the world, a new way of looking at each other, a new way of looking at our work. In this now but not yet time, we are to give people a glimpse of what the kingdom looks like, some of those promises that Jesus is talking about. How can we bring that to be? How can we show people what that looks like through our work? How can we give people a little taste of that? It's not just a message to proclaim. It's a whole way of life. So we have these different vignettes. We're coming to the end. We come to vignette five, the church. And that is, of course, the time that we are in. King Jesus has come, and he is seeking to do kingdom work through his people the church, through us. The church is meant to be the place where God's people gather to be equipped, to be encouraged, to be prayed for, 
before being scattered into all the different places that we go, into different workplaces, into the community, all the different places we go. We are there to actually do good work wherever we are sent, to hold back evil and to give a fragrant foretaste of the kingdom. By doing this, the church is actually embracing shalom. We're doing the good work that God has called us to do. One of my uh, favourite verses is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's handiwork. We have actually been lovingly crafted by God to do good works. Now, it's clear that it's not the good works that actually save us. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 make that abundantly clear. <laughs> but actually, we're saved to do good work. And God has prepared that good work for us to do. I love the image in Acts chapter 2 of the early church. Acts 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and the many one, at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We have this beautiful image of people coming together in their whole lives, coming together to talk with each other, to encourage each other, to worship together, to receive teaching, to get built up together. And then they go out, they go out to different places. And as we see later with Paul, they go out to the marketplace and they do their work and they talk to people and then they come back together again. And God blesses his people. What they're doing, their way of life is actually attractive. Uh, I noticed that we had verses coming up uh, just before the service and Romans 12, 1 came up, this idea of our whole bodies are meant to be the sacrifice and everything we do with our bodies, all our lives, all our work is meant to be the sacrifice that we offer to God. And Paul is more explicit about this probably in 1 Corinthians 10.31 where he says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, it, do it all for the glory of God. Each of us can do that. Mind-blowing idea number five. In the workplace, we may be the only Jesus that people ever meet, the only Bible that people ever read, We are meant to be scattered, not gathered only. And we need to help people when they are scattered. We need to equip them so that when they do represent Jesus, uh, they feel encouraged and they feel that they're prayed for and they feel that they are taking their whole church with them when they go to those scattered places wherever they are. And it's powerful what God can do with that. So we have all these different images. We have vineyard one, creation, and working the ground, keeping the garden. We have vineyard two, the fall, and people building a tower and a city to honour themselves and not God. But we want to honour God. We have vineyard three, Israel, and a people who will become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We have vineyard four, King Jesus, with a new vision for our whole lives, given as living sacrifices in the mission of redemption of the whole world, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favour. We have Vignette 5, the church, the ministry of bringing shalom, doing the good work, which God has prepared for us to do. And we have Vignette 6, the new creation. Uh, I love the image again, um, this big, big vision that we have in Revelations 21. Starting at verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. 
I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Now, uh, if you're in a workplace that is really difficult, if you're facing bullying, if it's a bit toxic there, if you're facing ethical decisions that really stretch you, you need that vision. (laughs) You need that image of the new creation that is going to come. You need that image of when there's a new order coming, when everything is put right. And you need to know that that is coming. That's a certainty. What's really interesting in these images of the new creation that we have in the Bible is that work is mentioned. It's one of the really depressing things that I get to tell people. There's going to be work in heaven. (laughs) People hate that. But it's bad theology to think that heaven is just a place of leisure and rest. We are made in the image of a working God. We are going to be working in heaven, but it's not going to be work as we know it. We don't know really what that work is going to be like, but it's going to be beautiful work. It's going to be productive, and we're going to be working with God. He's going to be dwelling there with us. I'm really excited about what that work might be. There's another uh, passage that gives us an insight into the new creation. It's Isaiah 65. Isaiah, And I've just mashed together 22b and 23a, so it's still one verse. But he says, My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labour in vain. Isn't that a great image? Don't you want that now with the different work that you do? <laughs> you want to actually... Enjoy the work of your hands and know that all that work that you're doing is not in vain. Uh, So that's the mind-blowing idea number six. Our work in heaven will be beautiful. It will be fulfilling as we work in partnership with God. We don't know what it looks like, but we know it will bring us great joy. So let me summarize this big journey through the Bible that we've taken these different vignettes, and what they teach us about our work. Number one, in creation, our work is about taking up our God-given responsibility to steward creation. And that's not just about the stuff we do. It's actually about preserving the relationship between creation and us and between us and God. Number two, the fall. We need to check the motivation of our working, whatever that working is. And make sure that we are working to honour God and not working to honour ourselves. Number three, Israel. God directs his people through visions that stimulate their imagination for effective working and also to sustain them through trials and tribulations. All those really hard essays when you've got a big deadline coming. Have that vision in front of you. Number four, Jesus. Jesus told us to repent, and that means that we need a new way of looking, a new way of looking at God, a new way of looking at the world, a new way of looking at the work that he has given us to do. Number five, the church. We are meant to be scattered, not gathered only. And we may be the only Jesus that people meet, the only Bible people read in the workplaces, in the different places, in the community or wherever he sends us. And number six, new creation. We will be working in heaven because we are made in the image of a working God. Because work is a good thing that's just been marred by the fall. Because all the images in the Bible of the new creation include an element of work. There is your theology of work. I hope it's helped you to see your work in a new way. I hope you can see your work as part of the big story of what God is doing in this world and in the world to come. And I hope it encourages and inspires you. Can I pray for us? Mm. 
Father God, thank you for this opportunity that we have to consider how your word talks about work. I thank you, Lord, that ideas and visions of work are scattered throughout your word. I thank you for the different ways that you talk about work and that you talk about yourself as a worker. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't do this separation thing that we are so tempted to do, that we would see our faith and our work perfectly united, that we would see that you are working through us in the different work that we do, paid or unpaid, wherever it is, and that we would offer it to you in worship, and that it may be something that honours you, that serves others, that it may be a worthy sacrifice that gives people a foretaste of the kingdom, an idea of who Jesus is, an idea of your truth through your word. Amen. Amen.